Hello and welcome to The Last and D, a board gaming podcast brought to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm your first time host, Alessio, and today I'm joined by Fen. Hello, I'm taking the back seat. And a great return here, Cara. Hi. In this episode, we will cover time and space with a look at Oplomacus series, Galaxy Tracker 2nd Edition and Star Wars Legion, not to be confused with Star Wars Armada. So, first, let's have our usual standy catch-up. I think it's just fair to begin with our returning speaker. So, how do you do, Cara? Um, yeah, I'm doing fine. It's nice to be back after um, I wasn't allowed to do anything. <laughs> yeah, nice to have you back. <laughs> yeah, um, Germany is kind of weird. So, um, basically, I was, was sick and was in a reintegration process. And during this process, I was not allowed to do anything any work outside of school so and technically this counts as work and therefore i wasn't allowed to sit with you and talk about board games which is weird but yeah so i'm uh, back i'm more or less healthy again and um yeah so i um what was the question how am i yeah i'm good <laughs> yeah and what have you been up to then um well, I have bought a house, um, which is, yeah, it's pretty great. I, I'm i not sure yet whether my board gaming table fits in the house. So, huh, I'll find out in uh, like three or four weeks. So, um, wish me luck. And um, apart from that, I'm playing a lot of a very big game that I think a lot of people right now play a lot of. Um, I'm talking about ATO, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> All-terrain so. operators for people who don't know the acronym. Exactly. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's co uh, covering my board gaming tale uh, for the last couple of weeks. I, I saw pictures of that board gaming table. That's huge. <laughs> yeah, it's big enough, so everything fits there, more or less. <laughs> So anyway, um, how have you been, Fan? I've been fine, thank you. Um, uh, I am, let's see, uh, Final Girl second season is on its way right now. Uh, we just set up to start playing uh, Aeon Zen Legacy of Graveholt, because um, uh, we want to see what that's like. Um, the first one was, it was enjoyable, but not great like mechanically Aeon's End is great um, it was just an on rail story excuse face these bosses which were mostly pretty good uh, but the second one appears to have a lot more story which I'm I'm never really happy about um, playing with other people I'm not in a mood to do group story time uh, it's one of the things I really like about um, oh, the artisans game Artisans of Splendor Vale, is it? Uh, everybody gets their own book in it. So, um, but anyway, it's the two of us could be playing through that um, soonish. And uh, the big thing is, um, I started doing my second play through of Aeon Trespass Odyssey to give it its proper name, not all terrain operatives. Um, and I ended up just having to be like, I can't play this, um, not because of anything to do with the game, but because it's just I. I Lived with it being so hard to keep tidy the first time I played through everything, but on this second playthrough, I just had to stop because I was like, there's piles everywhere and I can't ever get it organised in a way where I can see all the information I need to. Especially, like, I can put the, the board down fine and all the spaces for everything, that's great, but then I have to stick all the characters off to one side and, and everything and it's just, it was a bit much. And I also thought, maybe it's good to put a pause on the game and then come back to it after a little while and see what it's like. So in the meantime, I got the insert, uh, well, I was kindly sent the insert uh, for Aeon Trespass Odyssey from Fancy But Functional. And so this week I constructed that and got everything tidied up and put in there. And I'm going to, by the time I this podcast comes out, I'm going to have already written about the experience as well. Um, 
it was sent to me at uh, at no cost, which is really kind of them. Um, they like y- you don't need to review it, but I'm like I'm going to review it anyway because that's content. Um, <laughs> And so that's replaced it. It helps as well because my insert arrived broken. And also when I thought about, do I fix this insert? Do I try and get replacement? I realized, as I'm sure you did, Cara, as well, because I know you printed your own insert. Sleeve mm-hmm. cards don't fit. Deluxe tiles don't fit. And I was tired of this big pile of things. So um, I'm super excited now to get it back on the table over next week uh, so I can, like properly test out what it's like picking up the game again from in progress and having this all organized. And I also got contrast colors onto the models for the first cycle. Not going to do anything fancy painting them because I just don't have the time. Uh, and I've got to get work done before my hands, you know, I can only paint when my hands aren't shaking. So yeah, that's mostly, um, I say if you've not seen them before, uh, fancy but functional are located in Hungary, I believe. Um, and um, it, they do like uh, wooden inserts for a whole bunch of games. Sorry, Cara, go on. Um, I, I mean, I've seen the in- pictures of the insert and I think it looks interesting, but I'm always a little bit wary with inserts where, you know, they don't have the miniature trays because I feel like the miniatures are safer in their fitted trays. Um. If the miniatures were anything other than the plastic they're constructed of, I might be concerned. But uh, they, I'm, I'm really like my the miniature trays for me were shattered, and so that was not an option to keep them mm. stored in that. Uh, but also, this, this, the inserts have like padded foam on all the insides, and oh, okay. I'm really impressed with how they hold everything in. Uh, the stuff's all kept quite clear of um, each other, so painted, not going to clash in too much. Um, the only sort of thing that's kind of uh, missing is that the largest miniatures sit on the bottom of the box rather than like in a removable tray. They have spaces to keep them in place and the other miniatures sit on top. But this is Aeon Trespass Odyssey. You don't need all the big miniatures. Like there's one, you know, one nemesis, uh, sorry, pursuer or whatever, <laughs> adversary, that's the word. The, one adversary and like a few primordials per cycle so you can have them out on the table and just keep the rest in the box nice and tidy uh so for me especially having individual boxes to take um each primordial out and so they can sit on the table with all their cards in a really nice small footprint easy to access um i'm really liking what they've done uh they also sent me the darkest dungeon insert which has been a lifesaver because that game has the same problem a and trespass odyssey has uh, it sprawls everywhere across your table with a giant pile of everything. Um, so that was great. Uh, that one, you can still use the plastic miniature trays if you want to, because they do a separate miniature tray um, there. So Because the miniatures go in a different box anyway. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's my shout out to Fancy But Functional. Um, I, I've seen pictures of their Kingdom Death one. I think it looks really good. And I have their Madara one. That's the reason I reached out to them, because their Madara one, like... Same thing, it solved so many problems I was having with the game sprawling when playing and being disorganized when storage. So there we are. That's that's me. And, and so that, that leaves me. It leaves you, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I thought I'd be last in the queue because I have the first subject next. So uh, No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're gonna try I'm gonna try and abduct this segue from you, so you better how, how have you been, Alessio, apart from the impending me leaping in to take this segue, maybe? Oh uh, uh, how spontaneous of you. So uh, uh fine, thank you. Uh, I have been uh, well I uh, these last weeks uh, I've been traveling for business, so I basically stockpiling games for future plays. Uh, for instance, uh, I got sent, and I'm probably due to receive uh, right while we are recording now uh, the retail copy of Astronites, uh, which should be a simplified version uh, of Eon Send. Actually, uh, I am eager to try this one, so. Probably uh, we will talk about it if it's any good. And uh, 
well, a small announcement probably is due uh, when this episode ca- comes out. Uh, there will probably be a late pledge for uh, Townsfall Tassel, uh, uh, the reprint uh, and the expansions. Uh, it's uh, great. It's great, great stuff back there, and uh, I'm very impressed with the price. Uh, I think Penny Crawl did a great job of keeping the inflation to a minimum because the base game is one hundred and five dollars. So uh, I, I wanted to announce that because probably it's interesting to our audience, and. Uh, uh, I'm doing what everyone else is doing, so I'm just playing uh, Eon Trespass Odyssey right now. I'm uh, uh, doing the uh, the half second part of Cycle 3. It's uh, a bit complicated to say I'm finishing it because uh, that's uh, that point is usually where fights uh, start piling up. So <laughs> I, I did a lot to to counter the sprawling of the game, but basically I have uh, map holders uh, 3D printed and uh, laid out on the floor. <laughs> so basically <laughs> I did not a great job, but uh, uh, that makes me uh, able to keep everything on the, everything of the, related to the voyage phase on the box lid so that the table can be occupied by the staff for the battle phase. So that's basically my setup, not really professional. My life changed when I printed some holder for the Kratos tokens. So that's basically it. That's basically it. Uh, I have to say, cycle three is a lot of stuff to process. Also because uh, it looks like the the theme of the of the cycle is that the fate is taken against you. So uh, well, basically you went uh, you went really a, a, a long road uh, since you began. Uh... Hey, 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 we're getting too far into spoilers here and we're not talking about that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to take an executive call and cut you off here because <laughs> remember we have people who've not played the first and second cycle in this recording. Yeah, yeah but, but uh, no, the, the only one, uh, uh, you see, I, I was about to say you have come a long way since you eat primordials with pointy sticks and speaking of pointy sticks uh, what about Oplomacus? <laughs> I told you I was going to mess with your segue I warned you it's too easy that was easy, easy prophecy yeah okay. your turn then <laughs> so um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Hoplomachus Mostly about Hoplomachus Victorum, although I will briefly talk about Hoplomachus Remastered. This is from Chip Theory Games, and this is kind of their... It's their game that they got started with. Um, So they've gone back to revisit it and and do it again, uh, with um, Remastered being like a combined redone, a redo of all of their gladiatorial combat stuff, and then Victorum being a solo roguelike campaign game. Uh, right, so the setting is um, very Roman in theme. Um, there's Mount Vesuvius is part of the plot, blah, blah, blah. Pluto is for some reason being a bad guy, which is weird because Hades slash Pluto is not a bad guy, but often gets penned that way. Sure. Um, and uh, anyway, so in Victorum, you're going to play one of uh, a bunch of different champions who's going to do a load of tasks and beat a scion. And essentially, you've got to play through four acts. Um, at the end of each act, you're going to have to face a, a mini boss. Um, the first three of those are heroes that primuses that you didn't pick to play with when starting, uh, randomly determined, and then a scion at the end. And... Then you get to read a fun little uh, passage in the Scion epilogue book based on the particular Scion you beat and the hero you beat. Um, More on that a bit later. Anyway, this is like all of Chip Theory game stuff. It is um, why make anything out of cardboard when we could make it out of uh, plastic, plastic which has come from China, and plastic's made of oil, and we know where China gets the oil, don't we? So... Yeah, there's um, I, 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 I'm gonna like say it right here. 
There's nothing in this game that needed to be plastic. At all. Nothing. The, none of the functions in here require it. And uh, when it comes to components uh, wise, once you get past that, it's it's nicely done. Everything's compact. You have a main game mat you roll out. You put an arena mat in the middle of that, which will change depending on the place you're fighting in. Um, and then you have like spaces for organizing the rivals, whoever you're fighting in a given uh, battle, and then your own camp where you keep all your stuff. Um, but I mean, I I did link this uh, in the uh, in the Discord, and when I received the game, I took a look, went back and took a quick look at what they had for their environmental statement, and. <laughs> They, this is their environmental statement, and I will read it verba, uh, verbose, ver, verbatim. verbatim. Uh, so, environmental commitments, long-lasting design, CTG titles are some of the most durable board games in the world, built with materials that should last a lifetime. We do not use cheap materials that will wear out or need to be replaced, creating additional waste. Okay, um... <laughs> I've, that makes I've sense! Got, <laughs> I've got board games that are older than I am from my grandparents that like uh, my mum has a board game from the 1950s careers uh, th th this stuff was going to last multiple lifetimes probably you know it, some some uh, whoever it is who's in charge of archaeology like thousands of years from now is going to dig up a copy of a mouldering box and find inside it a bunch of shiny plastic cards and pieces and look it's Hopless Victorum and it will be put in a museum as uh, the folly of the plastic ages or something. So I'm, I'm tired of this gimmick. There's, there's nothing in this that should be. And do you know what really, like more than anything else, made me go, this is a nonsense statement. The hero tracking pad that you get in the game is made of paper. And there's a finite number of uses on it because you write on it and it's gone. You can spend money to get the upgraded neoprene hero tracking pad mat in the in your deluxe doobity doo doo. So, yeah, it, like, no, to last for a lifetime. Um, yeah, sure, I could print out more hero tracking things or whatever. That's fine. It's perfectly possible. But don't tell me you're making a, a board game that doesn't need anything replaced if you're going to then put some stuff in it that directly needs to be replaced because it's written on and used it's just all a bit um I, i've seen people say that they reckon one of the big things is of course it allows anyone reviewing to make that big joke about you can play it in the bathtub and then chuck in all their pieces in the bathtub which i think every almost every single reviewer at one time or another has either done or thought about doing so that's done i am very unimpressed with the physical of this physicality of this and i'm not going to talk about the plastic again except for one particular thing which is the health chips in this game suck you can buy deluxe health chips extra but that then means you've got a load of plastic you need to throw out because it's of no use uh, i didn't get the deluxe um, health chips i've handled them before they're the same as the ones in too many bones etc just different design um but the biggest problem i have with them is obviously these ones that come with the game they're not particularly weighty so they slide around a lot and just just even a decent set of poker chips they shouldn't they should have a bit of friction and a bit of weight to them so when you stack them the top chip doesn't like start going mm, i quite fancy following gravity here and zipping off the edge so it's a shame that the health chips are such uh, they're not the same quality as all the other chips in the game uh design wise it's very nice um the neoprene mat has the standard problem all neoprene mats have, which is if you keep it stored rolled up, uh, the one side of it always ends up like, because it's been so tightly coiled, a bit awful. Um, but the stadium seating bit's fantastic. This is a dashboard that you set up at the top and it holds all of the like different faction troops that are going to appear and it holds the cards for the various events and opportunities and it holds the dice, but not all of the dice. For some reason, this um, little uh, thing that the dice is supposed to fit in, um, I'm going to grab a picture for the others to to, to see, um, but you can you can see pictures of a board game geek. It doesn't hold all the dice that come with the game, and it doesn't even um, 
it holds like most of the dice, but has a gap where um, dice don't fit. If that makes any sense, so you sort of you rack in about twelve dice, and then there's room for a a half of a the two thirds of the thirteenth dice in okay. there. Okay, <laughs> and it's I like, it, and you can see if you look either side, you can see there's room for them to have extended the tray a little bit further to add more dice in. Um, the dice themselves are nice. Um, they vary in um, what their sides are. They're either misses or hits. Hits have a sword on them. Misses are blank with a little detailed outside. And they basically scale up with yellow having two hits and four blanks. And then, then it'll be like blue with three and three blanks. And so on and so forth up to the incredibly, po almost entirely pointless red dice, which has hits on every single side. So you, you don't throw it like i haven't <laughs> yet come across a circumstance where i've been like oh i should roll this red dice instead of just looked at it and gone that's an automatic hit <sighs> maybe maybe there is something that changes that maybe um but in my few playthroughs i've not found it and uh i, I kind of <laughs> the, these dice you know how when you play games um, and you miss it's always a bit frustrating and i'm terrible at rolling well i often roll blanks I find these dice to be very, they're not fun because uh, they're flat either giving you a number of one or nothing for each dice rolled. There's no, oh, this guarantees like double damage, two hits or something. There's no spark of a big kind of exciting, you know, that classic, I've rolled the maximum value, I get a bit more. Um, and I wish that some of the later dice, like the red dice, had maybe a two, two hit result on it. Now... I could be completely wrong, and maybe the red dice does have a two-hit result on it, and I've never rolled it because I roll like ass, but, you know, we'll see. Um, the game has plastic event cards. It has a huge pile of plastic prowess cards, which, because they're plastic, when I picked them up, they fired themselves across the entire kitchen. Uh, so I had to pick them all up again. That's something I don't like about plastic cards. Um, and they have signed reference cards for each of the Scions, arena reference cards, which are nicely double-sided, which is great. I like that. You know, use the back of your card if you don't need it for anything else. Use it for more info. And they've got uh, four arena mats. Again, they're double-sided for each of the different places you could be uh, fighting in. I love that they're double-sided. That's fantastic. Um, and I like the way they fit into the main mat. So, on the whole, the components are decent, um, excessive. Uh, but I, I, they do the job definitely, and the dashboard in particular, and the arena mat layout is is superb. But I do find myself like when I'm playing, wishing I was playing with cardboard on cardboard, you know, like nice cardboard discs on a cardboard board. I'd have liked that to have been an option for people who wanted to buy a cheaper version made with trees. Or, or, or hear me out. Yeah, cloth. I mean, if you use like chips, why not use a cloth board? You know, just okay. true, true. Um, yeah, there's the I can't remember the name of it now, but there's that lovely little game people are repairing, uh, comparing to the uh, King is Dead that is printed out on um, on cloth or sewed on cloth. It's been printed now. Shut up and sit down. Did a move uh, a video on it, and it's impossible to get now. Or really hard to yeah, get. I think to uh, wasn't it Pax Pamir that had a cloth? Um, I, I believe Pax Pamir has one. I was talking about a different game, yeah. but um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, cloth board would have been a a good substitute. Yeah, printed on cloth. Anyway, that's the components. So yeah, they're gonna last. They're gonna last longer than you do for sure. I mean, I imagine a bomb could drop on them and they'd still be playable. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's a selling point to me. Uh, on the other hand, the art's great. The rule book isn't. No index at all. Like, uh, the reference sheet at the back is okay, but it like the combat needed its own separate reference sheet, which it doesn't really have. So there's a lot of, like, reading... Um, there's a lot of exceptions in the game. Like, mechanically, it's not super complicated, as we'll find when we go through it all. Uh, they did give you a reference sheet for all of the abilities. That's very helpful. Um, so that makes life easier. And as I said, the game's not complicated, but it, this rulebook does not help you learn it particularly well. Um, I ended up having to watch the Chip Theory games 
um, how to play video, which was an hour and something. And I had to watch pretty much all of it sat there with the board game with me so I could figure out what was going on. So, all of that done. How does it play? Well, you start off, you pick your hero you're going to play as, and you set them up with the, like, starting health, uh, leadership, movement, range that they have, um, and uh, and then a number of blessings. Blessings are like, uh, if things are going really badly, you can spend them to get various benefits, like fully heal your hero, because uh, if your hero loses their last hit point, it's game over, and damage continues from one fight to the next. So you've got like six hit points, and you need to be careful with that. Um, you will start in the city of whichever region you're from. The recommended beginning character is um, Kraken Lance, who is uh, an Atlantean, so he's, he's the blue faction, so he'll start there. And your goal through the act is to travel around the map at the bottom of the game map, mat, um, to different locations and encountering one of the three different types of events, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, and then you're getting to the place where the act primaris is located and fighting um, them. And then if you succeed, second act, third act, and then fourth act is going to be the scion itself for the big grand finale. Uh, right, three locations. First one's opportunity events. Very simple. There's a deck of opportunity cards. You draw what, uh, two of those, you look at them, and it's it's cool. The decks are all kept face up towards you, so you have info in advance of at least half of what's going on, which is nice. Uh, I like it when games give you smart decisions um, and options, and you have some information. So yeah, you draw them, and they might be something like uh, spend all of your tactics um, tokens in a given region and get a bonus free troop which you can use as long as you know you're within your leadership which is how many units including yourself you can have uh also or other things like there are little challenges that you need to do that hinder you but it'll let you get stronger in certain ways or get access to better troops then the other two events are um, similar they're both going to be uh, combat I'll talk about bloodshed first. First, this is a fairly standard like goal for a battle. It's eliminate all the opposing units. Um, and that's kind of it, really. Uh, but the real kicker here is if any of your units die, they're not coming back. So you're thinking carefully about whether you're going to like you know accept the losses you have a chance to just walk away and, t and take the defeat without losing units that's always an option um so it is a it's it's interesting it reminds me of playing some of the like older uh video games a friend of mine fire emblem um uh okay sure yeah fire emblem um i think my partner plays fire emblem yeah so anyway there's <laughs> there's um there's like real repercussions to this uh, fight and then the other kind is sport which is non-lethal uh, so if anyone's eliminated they're out of the combat but they're going to be around for later and those have kind of like a non-lethal goal to them um, like capture the flag or king of the hill or just a kind of sparring event the twist with sports is there's going to be this one unit that comes out that is the um, like the local hero the local champion and they get a special token to indicate that. And uh, if you defeat them, then you get mobbed and beaten up and punished for doing so. You lose like almost all of your health. So you're encouraged to let them wander around and slap your units around. Um, so they get to look, you know, good in front of the local crowd, which is it's kind of fun. It does change the context of it because it means you can't you, c you can attack and take them out if you want to. But... Uh, you do get punished for doing that, so it's um, something you have to think about. Um, and, and yeah, that's that's like the sporting side of things. The event itself, you'll draw a card uh, from either the bloodshed or the sporting pile. It'll tell you what special rules are in play for that given event. It'll tell you what type it is if you're playing a sporting event, and sometimes you get a choice of the three. 
And um, it'll also tell you what opposing units are going to be there. There'll be like certain local units. They're drawn from the troops for the region, the coloured chips at the top. And then the rest are drawn out of the bag randomly. And what's interesting is gradually more and more troops will pile up into the bag. So it'll get quite varied what you're facing. But you'll face people you fa well, face units you faced before as time moves on. Your side, uh, you'll be allowed a certain number of units, usually your hero and a few more, like two, three, four units or whatever. Sometimes, the, like I had one I drew and it went, your hero's not allowed to participate in this. And I was like, oh dear. That was, uh, that was rough, that one. Um, but yeah, uh, now once you finish the fight, depending on the situation, if you won a bloodlust fight, then you get to basically improve your hero they can get more uh, leadership more um, let's, see if, let's get the actual page up here yeah so uh, for bloodshed you can up uh, add a leadership increase your health which will also increase your current health or you can improve one of your attack dies so heroes start with like uh, two blue attack die blue are like second lowest tier um, and then you know you can, you can increase up a tier and get a better die or you can add an extra die up to a maximum of four Sporting events, I really like. You've got a choice of either getting a whole new f set of tactics, which are like special chips that you can play to modify units, and they add a lot of interesting stuff to them. Um, one of the fun ones is like you can hobble a unit and they can move, but if they've moved, they're not allowed to attack. And that's like pretty useful to deal with a melee unit, because then as long as you're not stuck next to them, they, they basically spend the whole time chasing after you, trying to catch up. So it's a nice bit of uh, additional things with the tactics uh, or and this is super cool you can pick any one of the units that was defeated uh, a rival unit and recruit them to your to your team so yeah that's that's kind of how you get stronger and all really it's left is just to briefly talk about how the combat works um, the uh, rivals go first um, nobody starts deployed on the board there's like marked designated spots for you to deploy your units and them to deploy theirs. There's going to be special rules for the arena. For example, um, I think it's the Pluto one has um, two beasts in the arena and they will wander around and menace the rival units. The local units are fine, but the rival ones who are the white units, the neutral units, they, they can get menaced by these lions or chimera or a boar. Um, and or, or like the Atlantean one has a little trident in the middle that you can pick up and the special rules to throw it. But whoever you throw it at, if they're not taken out by it, they'll pick it up. And the local units and the rival units, they like to pick up the trident and throw it at your units. So there's a lot of that being thrown around. Um, yeah, the, the rivals will go first. They will deploy the top of their unit in their queue, uh, like usually one of the strongest units, the local unit. Um, and then anything put on the board is dazed, which is effectively like summoning sickness from Magic the Gathering. It means you can't do anything if you're de deployed unless you have special abilities that let you either move or attack. Um, they have a little AI chain that they'll follow to work out their targeting, which varies depending on the arena. Uh, and then your turn, you'll deploy. Um, and basically the turns are like the same. It's deploy, uh, use tactics card, move, everyone and then attack attacking is as simple as rolling the dice you have apply and and applying any number of hits as wounds directly there's not defense rolls but it's all altered in texture by the abilities of units which is where the kind of mix comes in some units for example will have taunt which means if you're next to them you've got to attack them not anyone else or they'll have um uh what's the name of it, it be let's get it right it begins with a c uh, it's interesting this one. Um, oh, I don't have the sheet here. But it's something like um, combat something. And it pins units in place. They can't move away if you're next to a unit with that. Uh, which is very cool. Or they may have range um, marked on their sheets. on their Sorry, on their chips. Um, and that allows them to fire at a bit of a longer distance. Or, and so on. Uh, like one guy I really enjoyed having. I was a reptilian from Atlantis, who's a three health unit with taunt, so, and regenerate. So he like runs up to someone and if they can't take him out in one blow, he'll just take more and more hits and heal them up and, and so on. So he can, he's great at bogging down an area. 
which is fantastic. Um, there's like the attack unit, the rival unit, that's like very good at attacking, it has retaliate, so it's it deals a lot of damage, it's fairly fragile, not much health, but when it gets hit, it, um, it deals a little bit of damage back as long as it wasn't taken out. And that's where the meat of the game is, with the changing of arenas, the different abilities for the different locations, and so on. Um, ultimately, uh, I think it's a fairly decent solo game. It's definitely fun for people who enjoy turn-based combat. Um, the rivals are not too complicated to operate, but there's enough going on that you do, you, you do find yourself looking and going, okay, they're going to go here and they're going to do this, so I need to go here and do this to mitigate that, or I need to avoid this unit right now and deal with this. Uh, there's a lot of tactical decisions. You add into that your tactics and your own unit abilities and everything, and and it's it's pretty cool. It's um, I don't know how much I'm gonna play it. Uh, it's it's good, um, but it's quite lengthy, um, and definitely something you need to leave set up. They do have rules for saving, but it doesn't quite cover everything. Um, so if you've got space to keep it set up while you're playing through, that definitely helps more. Uh, then there's a remastered, which is the purely combat version. It uses the same rule set. The difference is you are fighting like in a series of battles or, or, or a battle, and you'll be either playing like solo versus something or two together cooperative against AI, or you could play like two versus two and everything. Um, I haven't really had a chance to get properly into that. I've read the rules. Uh, I, that's why it's not the main thrust of my review here. Um, it does have integration with back and forth, um, but for some reason they decided to put the integration rules in the rule book to basically say go to this web page and follow these rules. Um, and it's like it's like two, two, three pages of rules, yeah? I don't understand why they couldn't have put those in the book, especially when you start looking at them and they're very straightforward what you're doing. Um, and essentially all that moves from remastered into Victorum is some of the unit types and it adds a little bit more variety in what you're playing. Uh, the biggest thing it does is it gives you access to like Beastmaster units so you can have a, uh, a, a unit who also has their like beast that um, uh, gets it, it gets involved which is kind of fun. The beast, if the, you lose the Beastmaster, the beast starts roaming around a bit more unpredictably and becomes hard to, to handle. Um, but really uh it's if you just want um the solo mode i don't think remastered is worth getting it's just a bunch of extra units um and likewise if you want the player versus player combat then you're going to be looking at uh, at hoplomachus remastered rather than victorum um there's they're definitely not good just as an expansion of one for the other um and that's it that's really it. So do you guys have any uh, questions? Oh, uh, actually, I know that there are competitive ones and the uh, campaign one and the solo one. Uh, my only one question is, you can solo play just Victorum? Yeah, yeah, Victorum is entirely solo play, yeah. If you wanted to play it with other people, you'd have to sort of sit together controlling one, one hero and making all the decisions, you know, like a group solo game. So yeah, Victorum is the solo one. While the other fighters are like battle arenas, like Gore yeah. Chosen or Mythic Battles is yeah, the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a battle arena game, yeah. Either versus like AI or other people. Okay, that, that's good. And how it fares against, for, for instance, uh, uh, Gore Chosen from Games Workshop? Um, I, as I said, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to play much of Remastered. <laughs> so I, it's... Uh, it's not for me. Um, I most, you know, like I'm going to probably play the, uh, there's a whole range you can do against, I think they're called Titans and they're very mm -hmm. powerful AI enemies and you can play those two players. So that's something I'm going to do a bit further down the line. But uh, yeah, it's, it's Victorum's mostly what I'm talking about here. So um, yeah. I, I couldn't answer much on Remastered beyond having ported the bits into Victorum and being like, okay, not really worth the, the price. So I better play remastered a bit. Okay, yeah. Uh, actually, I can relate. Uh, I am not a big fan of uh, battle arenas myself. 
No, I like um, dueling card games quite a lot, and I like summoning wars as a consequence. I may enjoy this because I, I, as I'm saying, I, I do like um, XCOM style games and. The guy who designed XCOM did a game called Chaos, and then there's one called Chaos Reborn, which is the one that I have actually played. And a lot of Hoplomachus reminds me of playing Chaos, which I like. You know, it's simplistic, but there's a, a fair bit of strategy involved. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it, it's pitting all fighters against all fighters and all players are in a brawl, uh, which is the concept I am not exactly uh, familiar with. But XCOM is a beautiful game. Chaos is a beautiful game. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's it. It's uh, it's fun. It's really expensive. I, I think if this was a cardboard version, it would be about half the price, and it would be something that I would just be saying, just get it, get it. But at the price it is at, um, and uh, I bought it by pre-ordering via Kickstarter. No, not via Kickstarter. Via my local store who kickstarted it. So I ended up paying less than the people who kickstarted it because I didn't have to pay for shipping. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any Kickstarter exclusives and the discount wasn't particularly big. So I, I, I'm, I think, I'm going to be honest, I don't think anyone should bo bother kickstarting chip theory game stuff anymore because this, it's just the value's not there. Um, get, it, get it from stores. Wait for the reviewers to play it and, and do it then. But uh, this, is, this is not too many bones. I think this is, I like this, I like this more than Cloud Spire, which is great as a solo game, uh, and a bit less than um, uh, Too Many Bones, so it sits between the two. I haven't had a chance to play Burn Cycle, um, and I don't know if I will, because I think maybe for me, um, I'm done with chip theory games now, um, mostly because I don't want another really heavy box filled with plastic. Um, I, I just can't, I can't support it anymore. It's especially do something about those health chip, chips, guys. Like, come on, come on. You're charging a premium. Give us good health chips as standard, not as extra. So that's Hoplomachus. Um, one and a half thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's just move from the Hoplomachus universe to the literal universe with, uh, well, uh, to a part of it at least, with Galaxy Tracker 2nd Edition, and that's uh, my game. Uh, so, Galaxy Tracker 2nd Edition is the, uh, well, 2nd edition of Galaxy Tracker, which is a game from 2007 from Vlata Civatlil. You might remember him from uh, games like uh, Mage Knight or Codenames, which are all excellent games in their own category. Uh, about uh, Galaxy Tracker, you are basically uh, a tracker from uh, uh, Incorporated Inc. Uh, I, I am quoting names, but I have a Italian edition, so I have to look up uh, all the names. So basically, you are a tracker who uh, delivers sewer pipes to to the customers across the galaxy and uh, since uh, galaxy travel is uh, so dangerous and there are space pirates, slavers, uh, meteor swarms and stuff like that, uh, Incorporated Inca had this brilliant idea of making the actual ships out of sewage pipes so that uh, if the ships uh, crash lands or arrives nearly there, the goods are delivered anyway. Uh, and that's basically the setup for the game, where uh, two to four players can uh, can contend in having a space race with uh, galaxy tracks made out of uh, uh, sewer pipes. Uh, the game is basically made... Uh, uh, I think the game is uh, very famous, but uh, I will briefly describe it. It's uh, basically divided into phases. In one you build uh, your uh, track and your spaceship and uh, this is a synchronous phase when everything happens real time among all players. So every player will be competing for the tiles which are usually face down uh, in the middle uh, representing a space junkyard. After you build your ship you have to uh, actually face the adventure 
and a part of the adventure will be known beforehand because uh, there are uh, three levels uh, of the adventure and depending on the level of difficulty you choose you pick some of these uh, you, you will always know three quarters of the cards you will face uh, while the last stack uh, you make uh, will be hidden so that you have to prepare for basically everything uh, the actual uh, adventure, the, the actual space trip, uh, will be just flipping cards and uh, moving uh, in uh, an initiative board and uh, basically uh, you resolve the events uh, you face, there will be positive ones where if you are in the lead of the tracks uh, uh, you will uh, probably take the most advantage out of them uh, and the negative ones where position might count or not but usually if there are space pirates uh, uh, you can for instance hope that someone else defeats them before you uh, the game is basically this of course the most famous part of galaxy tracker is building your spaceship uh, basically everyone uh, uh, you lay out a junkyard of all the tiles which compose a spaceship and every player has, his, has their own uh, blueprint of the ship uh, the blueprint is actually depending on the level of, dif of difficulty you want to face so uh, if everyone uh, everyone plays at the same difficulty level and uh, uh, you can make, uh, uh, you have basically a board which is on one side level 1, on the other side level 2, on the other side level 3. Yes, the, <laughs> the cardboard uh, tiles oh. here, yeah, have three sides. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and just quick note, it's actually wonder shit than used to be in the original first edition, which is a little bit of a shame. I think, the, I think it's the Enterprise layout that's missing in the second edition, um, which is one of the most fun because it quite often the saucer detaches off when you get an unlucky asteroid. Oh, actually, I didn't, uh, I didn't notice the Enterprise layout. I, I thought it was in Keep on Tracking, but yeah, I, I think yeah. it is now. But it was, it was it definitely in the original Galaxy Trucker. Ah, okay, or, well. or, or at least I had it in my original Galaxy Trucker box. Anyway, oh, that, that, that's that's a shame then. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm actually uh, quoting a bit of pa uh, of pages from the manual because the manual is so fun. Uh, I remember I said that uh, the manual for that time you killed me uh, was brilliant, and this one is uh, brilliant too. Uh, is called uh, the Tracker's Guide to Galaxy, and uh, yeah, yeah, they um they knock it out of the park with all of their manuals. They are well laid out. They're fun to read. They're easy to reference afterwards. It's it's superb. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if you have to judge a game by the manual, this one is beautiful. Anyway, uh, there are three sides. Three sides because basically the board is folded in half, and then you have one side, another side, and if you open the board on the flip side, there is the third, uh, the third level of the ship. Uh, that said, you basically have to fill your... You will start with, uh, I think, uh, a, a cabin, yeah, it will. It is probably called a cabin, and, uh, and a housing cabin or something like that, which is the first tile. The cabins hold your, uh, uh, your crew, and uh, you basically pick uh, uh, face down tiles from the junkyard, one at a time with one hand, uh, everyone at the same time, and check if you want to place it on your board. If you want to place it on your board, you go picking the next one, and uh, when you pick the next uh, tile, the one you uh, picked before is welded to the spaceship, so it's not moving anymore. Uh, that's it. Basically, it's a race to building the best ship possible with the best stuff uh, you get. But since it's usually advantageous or desirable to start first, uh, you usually want also to end uh, this phase as soon as possible. So the first player who wants, who decides, okay, my ship is uh, fine enough uh, the way it is. Uh, they can just call uh, stop and move the timer, which is uh, uh, hourglass, basically, uh, with roughly roughly no one, 90 seconds. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that's the time everyone else is left to complete their ship. After that, uh, with whatever ship you have, uh, you face the adventure. The adventure, everything can happen, and it usually happens. And uh, the higher the level, the most danger, the, the more dangerous it becomes. And uh, well, that's basically it. Uh, you usually get your spaceship uh, uh, holding on, or getting destroyed, or get completely annihilated by some random events uh, you didn't plan for and something like that at the end we we'll collect whoever collected the most money wins so that's basically it i think i think i didn't forgot anything about the best game yeah uh, i don't think so shall yeah we, shall we uh, shall we discuss the the the, the play of this because there's um there's some very interesting things about this but first of all kara go ahead Everything's fine. I'm I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. So I've played a lot of this. Um, a lot. Like I got this when it first came out. Um, unfortunately, it didn't survive the crossing over to Sweden. Um, so I had to get the second edition as well, which has thinner, lighter tiles than the original one. So I, I it's cheaper. Um, so that helps. But obviously, because it's it's cheaper because the quality is a bit lower. So I wanted to say that like this game, when you first approach it, you can be forgiven for thinking it's kind of like random chaos and nonsense, and you can certainly play it like that. But it turns out this game is like very uh, skill dependent, and if you're playing against somebody who is experienced in playing the game, they're gonna wreck you like most of the time because oh, yeah. th that big thing is you're like once you start building, you've got the moment where you can look in the different piles and see what's coming up ahead. And so, like, very good players will lock in a few important pieces and then look and see what's coming. And if you're really smart, you, you can you'd be like, there's no asteroids coming on, say, the right-hand side for this whole thing. So my right-hand side can be garbage. It doesn't need to be asteroid-proof. Or, oh boy, there's attacks coming in from the front or the rear or whatever. I'm going to need shields. So there's all of that to think about. And that's beyond just knowing exactly how what pieces are in there. Because there's certain bits that are one-offs or very few and they're really good and so you find them and you'll see like at least when we played quite a lot and people got experienced you had to look near other players because they would have really good pieces sitting near them in the general pool still but they were nearer to them so they could easily be grabbed and connected as soon as was required um, and that became a kind of like a real competition of can I risk putting this piece back or should I save that piece? Because if I leave it, somebody else may well take it immediately. Um, and it's great fun. And also, the different styles of ships. The slow cargo carrier, you know. If there's a lot of stops being made, you can you don't have to be first to win. You can just trawl around slowly grabbing stuff. Or you can build a very, very fast ship. Um, uh, or like the standard format is normally tr you try and get guns at the front. Engines at the back, a little bit of cargo, enough crew to withstand the worst, and then hopefully shields that point up and down and batteries to run it all, uh, which can be a bit much. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it is very, like, it, this is a game where skill is, and re repetition and playing again and again and again is rewarded. Yeah, uh, that's mostly my experience. I actually uh, began playing uh, like a month ago, so I, I'm not that experienced. I, I think I played uh, three times at level three, so <laughs> I uh, I am still a long road to go. Uh, um, we I, I mentioned the Enterprise ship. Uh, is, I can't remember because my copy's upstairs and I should have brought it down. Um, is there the double ships in in the core game? I don't think there is. Is there in second edition? There's two ships on the same board. Uh, that uh, I think I saw, but I didn't yet play on the Keep on Tracking expansion. Mm, I, see I the expansion. saw. Okay. Yeah, I, I see an expansion connect, which is basically two ships connected by a single tile. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Keep on tracking adds a lot more back in probably from the original stuff. That's yeah, keep, keep on tracking uh, looks a lot harder. <laughs> anyway, uh, the the 
the the thing i can say from experience is that actually it's very easy to get caught in the in the moment and so you start uh, uh, piling up stuff because uh, you want basically to keep your ship layout open but you want to close the sides because uh, uh, if you close the sides you will be safe from asteroids uh, so you are checking for pieces and then you uh, understand that you basically have locked yourself in uh, three connections uh, or two connections on one side which are basically impossible because you really wanted that laser but you cannot put them there uh, I think on my second play I've, I put double cannons everywhere and uh, I forgot the batteries so <laughs> there's a lot to consider for a new buy yeah yeah uh, it's also worth noting there is a app version um, it is normally uh, like just under 10 euros. Sometimes it goes on sale for like six euros. Uh, it's got a whole campaign system as well. Like you travel around a map and you do various different challenges. It's really fun. Um, it's not obviously it doesn't have the tactile experience, but you are still at times racing against AI building or you're trying to build for a certain goal, etc. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty good. Like it's definitely one of the more fun app implementations and it does enough to make it worthwhile yeah if you want a cell phone app i think it's three euros or three dollars or it's something it's always but, cheaper on but phones yeah for some reason yeah and and there also are in-app purchases but they don't exactly match the expansion they're called another way uh i didn't play the app so i don't know but of course i can see the benefits in playing this game via an app yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's mostly if you really like the game uh, to the point that you want to play it more and more or you want to try out the game for cheap. Um, yeah. But yeah, be, be warned, if uh, if you get deep into playing the app, you, you, you are going to have transferable skills, so things are going to <laughs> improve and other people who don't play as often will notice that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and also uh one thing to say about this the the you mentioned campaign play and uh, there is a kind of campaign game I think it wasn't present in the original edition maybe the intergalactic track. Uh but anyway, there is a kind of campaign game in, in which you try one to level 1, level 2, a level three games in such in succession and uh, it's cool because uh, after completing uh, the voyages you uh, can gain titles which give you asymmetric kind of asymmetric powers and they are beautiful they are uh, beautiful titles uh, which i want mangle by trying to translate it italian to english so they are just fun <laughs> like the rest of the game uh, that said, uh, what is important to know about this game is that this game is stupid fun, okay? Uh, sometimes it's very, very fun to just build a ship. It, it has a, a satisfaction in itself to just complete the, the most beautiful ship you can get, which gives you also points. Uh, the most some... beautiful ship constructed out yeah. of drainage piping. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the second, uh, the, the second thing is that uh, usually is also extremely fun to see other ships uh, getting wrecked when they stole that piece from you. <laughs> the, what I find really interesting is I've played it a lot uh, during university. A friend of mine uh, has it, and. Um, we played it a lot and uh, as as a fan said it's you see the skill difference so this friend always won and everyone knew that he will win so uh, we always played for second place basically um and i never knew that the ships are made of pipes <laughs> yeah yeah it's, I... <laughs> it's 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 a law in the in the book somewhere in there it talks about how the, that's the reason they connect so easily well together because it's just all yeah it, it, intergalactic plumbing uh, with different connectors for the different pipe types yeah poop ships so yeah, yeah basically exactly. i all the time i played it i never knew actually what i was playing so um that's interesting to know they call it civilization <laughs> so uh, that, that's basically it this is galaxy tracker second edition 
and uh, well uh, let's move away from this current galaxy and let's go to one far far away uh, so what's happening with rebels come in star wars legion cara well they get their ass kicked of course but <laughs> no, of <so> course <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, th 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 some rebels uh, rising up against the official government. That's not okay, you know. Um, it's an elected government. You keep that in mind in Star Wars. The people elected the yeah, government. Yeah, they applauded um, them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, Star Wars Legion. Um, I've talked about um, Star Wars X-Wing and Star Wars Armada before, so it's only fair and... Uh, that I will talk about Star Wars Legion as well. It's uh, the third um, of the Star Wars tabletop war games. Um, in X-Wing, you play fighter squadrons, dashing it out. Uh, in Armada, you play big fleets with capital ships uh, fighting against each other. And in Legion, you play ground troops. So it's more akin to the uh, typical uh, tabletop war games like Warhammer and such. Um, so you have your squads of uh, soldiers and uh, move them around, you know, by um, <clears throat> not measuring distances. You have uh, movement uh, tools with range one, two and three. And um, I think that makes it a little bit more accessible than other tabletop war games yeah uh, that's then, always an improvement yeah <laughs> yeah i i mean i've i've talked with people um about it and i i noticed just the, the concept of having to measure distances uh in inch or so is 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 off-putting for a lot of people so um having a movement tool you know slotted into the unit space and then you see where the unit can move that's that's easier to get into for a lot of people um but then you have for 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 um determining uh, attack range you do measure distance but not an inch you have a measuring tool for that with uh, you know different segments you can stick together and each segment is one unit of range basically um so yeah, um, the game is from 2018. Um, it had a like a second core set release in 2019, and uh, last year um, a kind of third core set, which isn't exactly a core set. So um, in the game you have four and a half factions. Um, you got your um, original uh, trilogy factions, the Imperium and the uh, rebels then you have your prequel trilogy factions the separatists and the uh, galactic republic and then you have the shadow collective which got released last year which confused a lot of people because it's not a faction but it f kind of functions like one so um basically it's there are Apart from the four factions, there are um, mercenaries and the factions can hire different mercenaries. So you can, you know, have some scum, some, some um, <clears throat> uh, bounty hunters or whatever in your Imperial army. And, um, and the Shadow Collective is a battle force. That's something that got introduced last year. Um, that consists exclusively of mercenaries, but they aren't a faction themselves. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, I don't want to go too much into detail regarding the rules. I mean, it's a tabletop war game, you know, you move units, you measure distance, you roll dice, you roll dice to defend, and then units are killed. Um, building your army is also not is particularly special. You have uh, your units, they cost a certain number of points, consist of a certain number of miniatures. Uh, for example, if you uh, take a phase one clone uh, trooper squ um, squad, um, it has four units and, um, and then you can buy upgrades for it. And um, <clears throat> there are like uh, equipment that they can carry with them, giving them additional abilities or um, also additional units so this clone squadron can maybe take a medic with them or um, 
someone uh, or a clone trooper with a rocket launcher um, so it can get up to six uh, models and um, one special thing the units are categorized um, in there are commanders um, which are basically you know your um, yeah, yeah, your heroes in Star Wars, you know, like um, Darth Vader or um, Anakin Skywalker and, um, or Captain Cody, uh, which will get released soonish. Um, so these are, you know, the commanders and every army has to have one or two commanders. And um, then you have your operatives, which are also usually, you know, named characters for the Republic. It's Padme Amilala or R2-D2. Um, so they are kind of similar to commanders, but they have some special role on the battlefield. Um, maybe they are particularly good at taking out um, enemy commanders, you know, like bounty hunters or so, or... Uh, in case of uh, Padme, the, she has this ability to infiltrate, you know, she and uh, have a secret mission where she can try to score additional victory points. And um, you don't have to take operatives, but I think you can take up to two in your army in a standard game. Then you have your core units. Um, for the Republic, it's phase one and phase two clone troopers for... Uh, the Empire, it's like different types of stormtroopers and um, you have to take three core units, which I find really great because it kind of um, offsets the, but other units are better, so I only take these good units. So you do have to take some rank and file standard schmucks with you, um, <clears throat> no way around it. Uh, then there are special forces, um, and uh, for Republic, I, I play Republic in this game as well. So that's the one I can talk the most about. Uh, uh, there it's um, the Ark Troopers, you know, specialized uh, special forces clones and um, Wookiees. Yeah, um, so um, I can take Wookiees uh, with my clone army. And, um, and then you have support units and um, heavy units which usually are some kind of vehicles or um, emplacement cannons or stuff like that. Um, from the scale, I mean, it's standard miniature war game scale comparable to Warhammer and such. Um, yeah, something like that. And um, the scope of the game isn't these vast, armies but it's also but it's bigger than uh, a skirmish game so it's somewhere in between um like my last list i created had one tank and i think 24 um clone miniatures so that's kind of where you're um sitting with this game uh, in regards to the scope um the biggest miniatures you don't have 8080s in the game. Um, the biggest ones are an ATST or the um, Snow Speeder um, from the Rebels. Uh, these are like the biggest units you can have. Um, yeah, so um, when you created your army, uh, your units, you also have to choose command cards and um, kind of like the, the, the battle cards. Um, the battle cards are an interesting concept um, because there are three types. First is um, setup, uh, which basically says, okay, where do people set up? What are their starting areas? Uh, the second one is uh, mission. So what actually gives victory points? It's not like, okay, I killed your unit with which is worth a hundred points. So I made a hundred points. No, um, usually killing units doesn't give you points. Um, you have some goal to achieve, like uh, capturing strategic locations or rescuing a hostage or stuff like that. Um, and then you have um, these, uh, I'm missing the English word here, um, like, you know, uh, how's the weather or, or stuff like that. Um, so cards that 
say um, what influences the battle. What, so like terrain or environmental modifiers? Environmental modifiers, that's uh, good. And, um, <clears throat> and the thing is, when you create your army, for each category you have to choose four cards. And um, when the players meet, they show each other um, their armies and how many points they cost. And the one that spent less points uh, gets to choose whether they want to be starting player or not. And, um, and the starting player gets to, to, gets to use uh, all the um, battle cards of the starting player basically get used. And that works so you lay you draw three of each card type. So you chose four, choose uh, you chose four, for example, mission cards, draw three of them, lay them out in random order, and then both players start banning cards. So um, everyone can ban two cards, they take turns, and then they go from left to right and the leftmost card in each category that is left is used then. So that means if you have a sign player and your cards get chosen, you know one of your missions will be it and the other player sees, okay, like the first mission is bombing run and I don't have units that are fast enough to place bombs in the enemy's zone, so I ban this one because I don't want that one. Yeah, a smart variant on Captain's Mod. Cool. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's really cool. It makes the creation of your army uh, quite interesting because, of course, you you know what your missions are and you can figure out, okay, my army, what can it do well? Um, what can't it do well? So you pick missions you're good at, and it also means so. Uh, yeah, I have 800 points for my army, but maybe I should only spend 790. So I actually get to choose my cars in the end. Um, so yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. And um, yeah, the environmental cards is stuff like, for example, hey, it's very dusty, so long range attacks are not possible, or um, maybe it's just good weather, nothing happens or stuff like that. And um, yeah, so these are the battle cards and then you have your command cards. Um, each commander and operative has command cards um, and you create a deck of seven cards. One of them is the same for every game. It's like a standard, I don't have anything else to do, so I play this card. and. Um, and then you get to choose six additional cards. There are generic ones, but there are also the specific ones for the commanders. Usually a commander has three cards. They have uh, one, two, or three pips on them. And uh, at the beginning of a turn, every player chooses one of their command cards in secret. Then they um, reveal them and the one with the lowest number of pips um, has the initiative for this round. And um, they usually have uh, specific uh, abilities as well. And, um, you know, for example, one of the uh, uh, <clears throat> clone command cards um, has like uh, air support, uh, you know, an attack from, from an airship and, um, or uh, Anakin has cards, basically they stay in play and each card gives him additional abilities. So over the course of the game, Anakin becomes um, stronger. And um, yeah, so um, that gives you a lot of ways to um, adjust your, your army in a different way uh, because the same army with different command cards can play very differently. And um, yeah, also there's some kind of uh, mind game happening. Uh, so, oh, do I play my one pip card now or should I wait? And um, yeah. Right, and uh, the game is played over um, six turns. And um, <clears throat> at the beginning of each turn, you play your command cards and then um, you um, give orders to the units. Um, basically for each unit you have, you have a token um, with the Unix basically uh, rank or category on it. And um, your command card 
gives units orders. So that means if I have a command card that gives orders to three core troopers, I can place uh, markers at three core trooper units. Um, the rest is basically in a bag and when it's my turn I can either activate a unit that has a command or I can pull one out of the bag and activate a matching unit. Uh, so it means if you build an army that has a lot of commands spread out at the beginning of a turn, you have a lot of control over what you do. Because it's not like in other games where you have, okay, now is the movement phase, so everyone moves, and then is the shooting phase, so everyone shoots, but um, you take turns activating one unit, and this unit does all their actions. So it moves, it attacks, and so knowing which units you can activate and um, being able to activate certain units when you want to is very helpful. While other units you're like, ah, I don't care, I just pulled randomly out of the bag and see what happens. Um, yeah, and that's what the command cards are for because each command card gives different types of orders. And um, for example, Anakin's command cards usually give Anakin a command token. So, um, you know, if you play Anakin command, you can activate Anakin whenever you want. Um, and not when the lack of a draw tells you to. <laughs> yeah, Sekigara Unification of Japan uh, has a similar mechanic. It works a bit different in which you activate only the units for which you play cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that's mostly it See? about the game. There is um, there are different uh, Se 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 the the game modes. I mean, the standard mi game mi is 800 points. Then you have uh, smaller skirmish games with 500 points. Okay, they grazie. use different sì, command cards because Ciao. they are played on a smaller sì. scale, on okay. a smaller um, area. Um, usually it's played on a three by six foot, um, but the um, skirmish one is played on, uh, no, sorry, four, four by, oh my, now I've confused myself. No, three by six and the skirmish one is played on three by three. And um, then there's also like a big scale thing where you can with, play with 1,200 or 1,400 points. But of course you can also say, hey, I don't have anything to do for the next week. So let's do a 2,000, 5,000, whatever game. I've read a lot of different uh, things. I can't imagine these big games, but um, yeah. And then there is the other special thing, you know, with the Shadow Collective, um, they introduced these battle forces. Uh, each faction has a battle force, plus there is the Shadow Collective battle force. The idea behind them is you have this uh, thematic army. Um, for example, with um, the Empire, you have the snow or the blizzard force, you know, the, the army that attacked the rebels on Hoth. And um, so these battle forces limit you in what units you can take and um, have specific command cards you can use with this battle force and have different you know limits in how many of these units you can take so for example the um, uh, republic battle force is the um, Oh, I think I'm losing my um, nerd cred when I'm getting it wrong now. 300 first. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, led by Anakin and Captain Rex. And um, they are allowed to take more from, of the uh, ARC troopers with them than regular armies, uh, but are limited in other ways. So they can't take all the support and heavy uh, units. Um, a regular army can take so yeah it's it's just a way to build an army differently more thematically um yeah so streamline the warhammer i i guess i mean yeah kind of um i personally i really like the game um i think it's i mean i have of the three star wars tabletop games i um enjoy x-wing the least and i think legion and armada are pretty even uh, but it's easier to find people who play legion than armada and um 
it's also surprisingly cheap to get into for a tabletop war game. The, uh, there are two core boxes. The first one is for um, the Empire and Republic. So you have like Luke and Darth Vader and a few um, units for each side. And the second one is for uh, Separatists versus um, Republic. So um, depending on what faction you want to play, one of these core boxes fits your needs and they cost around 100, 120 euros. And um, are, yeah, uh, I mean, ideally you find someone you want to start with and you buy two core boxes and separate them and then you already have more or less enough to build an army. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, you can sink a lot of money in it, but... Um, you are not required to. Yeah, I think by now with everything I bought, I'm at like 600 euros and I have really everything for the Republic and multiple versions of everything. And so, um, yeah, I like it. Recommend it. <laughs> okay. So that's it for today. We have gone full, full circle. We basically started the episode with pointy sticks with that ru ruined segue. And uh, we end uh, with pointy sticks because we rem we all remember how it ended at the moon of Endor. So uh, <laughs> that's all for this episode. You can catch us at the last standee on uh, your favorite podcast platform, or you can support us and read our other articles at www.patreon.com slash the last and uh, You can drop by and have a chat with us in our Discord server. Links are on Patreon page. And uh, until next time, I guess it's goodbye from Cara. Bye. Fan. Hello. And myself, Alessio. Goodbye. So, see you in the next episode of the Last and D podcast. And remember, the second D stands for Endor. <laughs>